One of my favorite quotes ever is the Howard Thurman quote, you know, don't think about what the world needs. Think about what makes you come alive because the world needs people that have come alive. And children, if you look at children or you think about yourself when you were a child, a lot of us had a strong sense of what made us come alive. Those things that you love to do as a child that you gravitated towards. It's, it's not the problem that people don't find what is their path and what makes them unique and what they're good at and what they love. The problem is they kind of, they, they had it and they lost it. I think that the world would be so much more peaceful because I think people would be the best versions of themselves making their best contribution to society. So the, the workplace, the world, it would look different and it would, you know, the, the output would be different because when people are all working on things that they're super into and, you know, is aligned with their personality and their strengths, the outputs are going to be much more amazing. We're going to be coming up with incredible solutions to all these problems that you mentioned up front when we started this episode. Hello, this is Dr. Edith Ubuntu Chan. Welcome to The Dr. E Show, a show exploring the frontiers of our human possibilities in areas like health and wellness, science and spirituality, quantum biology, and conscious living, so that together we can awaken the best of ourselves and create our most joyful and fulfilling lives. When we watch the news and see the urgent issues facing our society today, like crime, the divisiveness, the health crisis, environmental degradation, so often we find lawmakers and TV talking heads discussing solutions that are really only short-term band-aids. But in reality, how much of these problems are actually rooted in our earliest of childhood experiences? What if we can think much more holistically about the opportunities to influence the future of our society as a whole by changing the way that we bring up our babies and our young children? For example, did you know that 85% of our brains are developed from age zero to three? And did you know that the most influential perception programming of the subconscious mind and our worldviews and our belief systems actually occurs from birth through age six? What if we could invest in our little ones and create a whole new society of well-adjusted, healthy, happy humans who are smarter, more compassionate, more creative, and more innovative? To shed light on this very important topic is my good friend, Zara Kazam. Zara is the founder and CEO of Monty Kids, the famous subscription-based program for children aged zero to three that provides authentic Montessori education. Sara is a superstar. She holds a BA in psychology from Harvard University, a master's degree from Harvard Graduate School of Education. She's an internationally certified Montessori teacher at the infant, toddler, and preschool levels, and super mom to two beautiful young boys. Through Monty Kids, Sara is filling the important gap from birth to preschool. These are the most critical years of development when 85% of the brain is formed. Sarah has been invited to the White House Early Education Summit, named the Global Education Influencer, a world-changing woman by Conscious Company Media, and she was nominated for the Dalai Lama Unsung Heroes of Compassion Awards for her work with children. Sarah has appeared on ABC's Shark Tank in January 2019 and secured a deal with the famous Kevin O'Leary. So please help me in welcoming my good friend, the rock star, the founder, the CEO of Monty Kids, Sarah Kassam. Yay! Yay. Sarah. <laughs> what an intro. Thank you. <laughs> I know you're a super busy lady juggling a growing company. Congratulations on all your success. It was such an honor to know you in the early days of Monty Kids and then watching you juggle all of that, have one kid and a second kid, and I'm always blown away how you do it all. So many things to talk about. Could you please introduce yourself to our audience? How do you get interested in Montessori education to begin with? 
Sure. So I will start at the beginning. When I was a little girl, I knew when I was 10 years old that I wanted to be a teacher. My, uh, my school paired me with a, a younger reading buddy and I was helping her learn how to read. And I was like, well, this is absolutely what I want to do with my life. So then I dedicated, you know, all my after school jobs, all my summer jobs to teaching, went and pursued my degrees in child psychology and education and discovered from my work there that I could make the biggest impact with children by working at the youngest ages because of the way the brain is developed. And that's kind of when I stumbled across Montessori. I, I think it's absolutely the best way to educate young children. It is the world's most popular early education method. There's 25,000 Montessori schools in 144 countries. It's been around 100 years, backed by research. I, I had like a, a little personal connection with it through a bit of a crisis after I graduated college when I saw all the, the people around me going into investment banking, management consulting, you know, and, and without much passion and purpose. And I had always wanted to be a teacher, but it felt like not, you know, people kept telling me, well, don't go and teach, you know, you just graduated from Harvard, go and go and do one of these other kind of sexier jobs. And I was just disillusioned and thinking, what is the point of all this education that we've been through if we don't have that passion and that purpose? And I happened to, because I was always working in schools, I happened to visit a Montessori school and I saw these four-year-olds who had that. They were self-directed in their learning. They were in flow. And the, the people at the Flow Genome Project who study flow have actually named Montessori schools as one of the highest flow environments. You know, they look at all these amazing companies, Google and, and things like that. But it really is, it's, it's an incredible self-directed learning journey that children are kind of taken through, guided through. I just felt like if this is, this is what education is supposed to be like, because if we start learning in that way from a very young age, we won't have that crisis of, of purpose. You know, we'll, we'll discover our gifts at a really young age and develop our talents and, and be put on the path that we are meant to be on. So that's my personal connection with Montessori. I thought I wanted to be in the classroom as I always knew. And so I, Fine, you know, I did my, my two Montessori teacher trainings and finally got my dream job as a preschool teacher. And then I had my baby and I have a seven-year-old and I have a, a one-year-old, but my seven-year-old was born and I was so excited to give him like the best start right from birth. And I started, you know, doing that at home and it was really, really difficult to keep up with his development as a parent between the diapering and the, and the feedings and just, I mean, he was changing so quickly. And so, and I started thinking about it, like we are by default, our children's first teachers. We don't have enough support. And, and the school where I was working started at age three and most preschools around the world start at age three, but 85% of the brain is formed by three. And there's just this void in education during the most critical time of human development. Right. That is a huge problem. And so I left the school where I was working to start my company, Monty Kids, which brings this world-class Montessori education to the home and makes it really accessible for parents to use. We send wooden, hands-on learning tools, toys for the babies, um, and videos and, and guides that show parents how to use it all. And Dr. E, you were one of our very first customers. Yeah, when you first launched Beta, my boy was already about to turn two. So we only got to experience the last six months of yeah. the two to two and a half program back in those early days. And I have to say now he's four and a half and he still loves your Monty toys because they're so sturdy and beautifully made. And he has like a sparkle, a joy because he has so many critical happy memories associated with them and now he's still inventing new variations of games he could play with those toys i mean it's kind of like the gift that keeps on giving you know and now i have a baby in my belly and i'm excited to go through the entire journey from zero to three all the way through and see the magic that unfolds so i'm so excited that i get to see all of the beautiful work that you put into this i'm i'm very excited for that <laughs> Wow, so many things that I'd love to talk to you about. 
why has there been this void? What's the hurdle? Why hasn't it been known? Because actually, until I met you, I had no idea Montessori even existed for zero to three. Because we always think about, oh, early childhood education means preschool and kindergarten. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't even like click for us. When we hear the term early childhood education, it means education can begin from the moment that the baby is born. And every parent is like, oh, going and eyeing about, you know, you see the pediatrician, they're like, oh, are they rolling over? Are they crawling? You know, are they developing these certain motor skills? But actually these things can be encouraged and nurtured and cultivated. And most of us have no idea about that. Yeah, so the reason that the void exists, I mean, it's actually only in the in the past few years that even preschool is widely regarded as a good thing, you know. So our society is like slowly starting to wake up to early learning in general. And the, the preschool, you know, it's it's been established now because there's been so many research studies on children who don't have opportunities to learn kind of in, in tough circumstances, getting a really high quality preschool intervention. And, and the results are astounding, you know, like long-term outcomes, like compared to their peers, they're, they're not incarcerated as much, lower rates of divorce, just higher life satisfaction and health outcomes. It's, it's pretty amazing what an early education can do. And so now there's this push in several states to, do, to get universal preschool for four-year-olds. So when I was invited to the White House, that was a big celebration for universal preschool grants in many of, sta of the states. And, you know, someone stood up who works on who works on early education in Oklahoma. And he said, we've had universal preschool for many years. And it actually made things worse because when you take the four year olds out of these centers, these private centers, they lose money and you're offering worse services now to zero to three year olds, which is actually the most critical time of development. So, so all these kids are ending up worse off. It's not widely known. There's not a lot of research on it. You know, there's a lot of cultural just misunderstanding of what a baby's capable of. And then, and then it doesn't make money is, you know, often the case with, with these things that aren't given a lot of importance in a, in a school setting the infant toddler program is always a money loser because you need so many adults to monitor little babies. And so schools actually lose money on infant toddler programs and they're not, and, and they're not widely available for that reason. That's <laughs> it's the most interesting thing about all those, you know, we talk about this in, in super wellness a lot. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you guys, Zara looks so beautiful and radiant, and I'd like to take a tiny slice of the partial credit because she's a proud graduate of our super wellness course, and yes. she's got all the breathing and Qigong tools. And, yes. Um, that and is, so I have to say, Dr. E, for your listeners, that I was going through a very hard time as a founder and mom to very young children when I met you, health-wise, and your super wellness course, like, turned it around, really just like redefined what health and wellness could be for me, opened up so much space and energy in my life that I didn't even realize was a possibility. I had, I, I had space in my life for a second baby after I, met, after I met you and started practicing super wellness. So that's a big, big thank you. Well, it makes me so happy because our super wellness class and community attracts a lot of amazing people like you who have huge dreams who want to make the world a better place and really make a huge impact in the world. But we all need to take beautiful care of ourselves, our well-being, so that we have the energy to serve in that bigger way, you know? So it's a huge honor that I got to support you at that perfect juncture when it was so critical to the launching of Monty Kids. And look at us now, you know, Shark Tank and upcoming TED Talks and so many beautiful growths and developments happening for you. Yeah. So back to this idea that some of the most important things that are most game-changing for society don't make money. Mm -hmm. It's a big problem across yeah. all sectors of society and education being a huge one. So a lot of times as citizens, we want to complain and point fingers at the government. It's like the lawmakers, the government, this is the government's job to then fund this, right? because private industry is hard to make a profit. So tell us about your journey to start a company. That's a big hurdle, 
right? Because to make these beautiful toys, they're so high quality. And also the production value of your beautiful videos. I mean, your company is a little bit about these amazing toys and tools that you've created custom, but a lot about how you educate and train the parents. Yeah. So that we understand how to support our kids way beyond just the interaction of those toys. It's a coaching for parents from age zero to three that is completely missing from our society. It takes money and funding to build all of that. Yes, it does. <laughs> so tell us about that hurdle to create a solution that is actually viable and sustainable in the marketplace when really, honestly, the government should be doing this, you know? Yeah, let's yeah. Not, let's not wait. Tell us about right. it. Yeah, I, I studied, so part of my studies were, were on education policy, and I'm so grateful to the people working in government and policy to try to change that. I'm too impatient, I think, for that work. And so starting a company going direct to parents, I think, was my where my heart was. It was, you know, it was a tough journey to just start with the physical physical toys because all of the safety companies told us it was impossible. Of all toys in the US, only 4% are marked safe for, for children under three. And the laws are so, so stringent as they should be. But everyone was telling us, all the experts, told us it was impossible. And so we worked for three years because that, you know, I just was even more motivated after I heard that to figure it out and, and make the, make the physical product and then develop the videos and the, the program for the parents, because it's all about this, you know, we, we call it the intergenerational approach. The parent and the baby learning together is the most effective way. Uh, finding investors was actually, in the beginning, surprisingly, it happened very smoothly. I found some really caring individuals who understood the vision, saw the big need, had struggled uh, with the same things when their children were young, and they were our first investors. And it, it happened in a really smooth, beautiful way. And then it was funny, you know, as I came out to, to talk to more institutional investors. So those were our first kind of individual investors, our angels, as we call them. And then as I talked to more institutions, they, this was, you know, five and a half years ago when I was raising our first round of funding, people were just like, what education for babies? Like, no, there was so many VC and the, the VC industry has changed so much in terms of funding education. But at that time, everybody was just looking at, at K-12. And so even the few funds that were doing preschool were not doing babies. But that just shows how quickly things can change because nowadays, you know, investors are really excited about, about getting involved. Awesome. And what kind of feedback are you getting from all the parents now that we're a couple of years into the launch? It's amazing. Parents are just, they, they talk about it as like a lifesaver, you know, just the whole package coming to their door. I designed it how I wanted it to be for myself like as a busy parent. Just send me everything I need. Tell me what I need to know when I need to know it. Make the videos short and sweet. And so parents really find that to be very helpful. And then they're most blown away by the fact, because they, they assume it's going to take a lot of time, but we've really made it easy for them. And then they're blown away that they gain time because, and you'll see this when, you're, when your new baby comes, I'm so excited. Level one is my favorite. It's for the newborns. We have these gorgeous mobiles for infants because what an infant sees in the first few months of development influences the development of their vision. They're not just gifted with a set of visual skills. So, so we want to make sure we're giving them a lot of stimulation, the right stimulation at the right time. But babies will concentrate for 30 minutes on a mobile. And wow. parents are like, oh my God, I'm relaxing. For <laughs> and I I'm like, go take a shower for once. Yeah. And then, and it, it continues, you know, as they get, it just kind of lays the foundation for more and more. So at one year old, babies are playing for an hour by themselves, like super engaged and happy and creative. And these are the types of learners, you know, at this age, babies are learning how to learn. And these are the practices we want to give them. We want to give them concentration, perseverance through challenges. And so that's, that's what parents see. And they're pretty blown away by it. That's so dreamy because to yeah. be honest, you know, I have a four and a half year old and there are those days where it's just like, I need to get some stuff done and I don't want to do too much screen time, but 
here's some cartoons and I hope it's wholesome because I'm not watching it the whole time, right? Like to have a really educational, developmentally nurturing, non-screen way to keep your child engaged for that period of time. So that is a win-win. They're being nurtured and you get a chance to go, you know, like take a shower. It's a godsend. (laughs) Definitely, yeah. So tell us, um, I think every listener out there has heard of Montessori. Some of us listening maybe went to Montessori kindergarten and so on. But for those of us that aren't familiar, what exactly is Montessori and why has it been proven to be so successful? What's special about it? Yeah, so it really is just developmental education, which is really special because it is, so I mentioned it was developed over 100 years ago um, by the first female physician in Italy. Dr. Maria Montessori fought her way into medical school. She was one of these trailblazing women. She's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize three times, which is amazing. But the way you know she developed this education method was through observing children's needs, this very like scientifically rigorous method of observing and then responding and offering materials and trial and error. And that's how she developed her whole system. And that is why, you know, over a hundred years later in all over the world, in schools everywhere, it works because children are children. And, and that's a really beautiful lesson also for parents that, you know, you can introduce this, this method and it's universal and it works so well, but it, it was based on observation and that's really how it's best delivered through observing your own child and their unique needs. You know, what is coming up for them? What are they, what are they gravitating towards? What are they not interested in right now? What do they need more of? And who, are, who is this little person? You know, what is really feeding them? Because it's all about taking children on, this, on this un, their unique developmental path. So there's this amazing universal curriculum complemented by observation and support from a loving adult. So she developed systematic ways to educate children from age zero until high school? Exactly. How and it does it go? Yeah, it's, it's from zero through high school. She spent the majority of her life on the three to six curriculum. The three to six is the most popular. So usually when people think of Montessori, they think of preschool for three to six year olds because of that. But more and more schools have the zero to three and, the, and even the high school now. And it's all about hands-on learning. Well, in traditional education, there's really like the, the teacher and the child and the teacher is giving the child the information, right? It's like a straight line. And in Montessori education, we think of a triangle where there's a child and, and the teacher and the environment. We don't actually even call the teacher a teacher. We call them a guide. And the role of the guide is to link the child with the environment. So it's all about preparing this amazingly rich environment and letting the child learn through exploration and play really hands-on learning because that's how children learn best. That's the most powerful way for anyone to learn. And so preparing that environment is, you know, it looks different at every stage. So at this stage, mo- visual mobiles for newborns, you know, puzzles and hands-on manipulatives as they get older. In high school, it's amazing. They're learning from building a business. And, you know, so uh, the traditional model is a farm school where they're growing food and then selling the food like in a farmer's market but in cities they have high schools where high schoolers are running a coffee shop and they're learning their you know if they're on a farm they're learning all their science and biology through that they're learning their math through running the business but it's it's about this experiential child directed education for life yeah it it sounds so reasonable and so <laughs> obvious that that's what we as adults when you don't want to learn something you learn by doing right and experimenting with it and it seems so crazy and archaic that the majority of our school system still has like lecture memorization regurgitation it's like what a way to squash human creativity and you know just bore us out of our minds you know we live in a world now where all that boring stuff should is being done by robot yeah 
I, I know I'm preaching to the choir, our audience yeah. already on top of this, but you know, so much of our education is training us to do robotic things that really are totally already obsolete, if not already in the next decade, totally obsolete. So preparing children to think and problem solve in a more creative, self-directed way is like the single most important yeah. skill that you could possibly cultivate as a human, you know? Yeah, and there's a lot of people writing about this now. There's there's um, a group called the Montessori Mafia, which is like the founders of Google and Amazon and Wikipedia and a lot of a lot of famous Beyonce and Puff Daddy. These these people all went to Montessori schools, and it's it just really highlights that you know these creative, incredible, innovative thinkers had this type of education where they were free to follow their own interests within an environment that you know Montessori is so beautiful because it's like the perfect balance between freedom and structure because the environment has been created, so there's like a natural structure within it, and then you're free to gravitate to what to what appeals to you. It's interesting because I've heard this, and correct me if I'm wrong, my boy went to a preschool that's Reggio style, yeah. and um, we had amazing teachers that were very experienced the first year we were there, and there was some teacher turnover. One of the teachers went away for maternity leave, another got hired by another school, and then they had all brand new teachers, and it was a struggle. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and so I often wonder in the Reggio environment, because it's got a different blend of, it's got more structure, but also flexibility. I wonder if it's more um, foolproof in terms of like, you know, that, that the system is so solid that even if you have a not the best teacher, it still works out. Can you talk to that? Because some of us as parents, I think all the parents out there, we're all doing our absolute best raising our children, but we're not always the best of ourselves. And sometimes we don't know what we don't know. So tell us about how Montessori system kind of like holds you and, right. and makes it so that it's more foolproof for the facilitator or guide. Right. I mean, the, the, the teacher is always kind of the most important aspect of the environment in a school setting. So that is critical. The nice thing about Montessori is that it is the most well-developed infant toddler curriculum, early education curriculum, really. And there's articles in Science and Nature and all the top research journals showing, you know, that this really works. And so because you do have this core curriculum, it's we, we do follow the child as the child is really interested in in plants or animals will bring more stuff into the environment to, to nurture that interest. But there is a core curriculum based on universal child development that makes sure that there's just like a, a standard of, of learning in the classroom. Some, some other curriculums don't have that. When it's all, you know, this emergent learning and it's all on the teacher's shoulders to just kind of follow the child without a basis of a core curriculum, it does get, you know, it, it's, it gets harder and it's really, really important to, to look very, very closely into the teacher in the school. What are some of the key things that the Flow Genome Project found that were really interesting about how Montessori creates that optimal flow environment for us to learn and grow? Yeah, there's, again, like just the things that, that good flow environments have in common. Some of them are like having a rich environment. So a lot of access to great materials and then having independence in your learning and in your, you know, they found the same thing in work environments. If you have a manager breathing down your neck and every, you know, hour of your day is scheduled, you're going to be a lot less excited and therefore a lot less productive probably in your work. And in, in Montessori schools, you know, we don't have t like, there's not the bell rings and it's time for music and now it's time for math. And there's just, you do what you're interested in at the moment, which is an incredible way. I mean, can you imagine learning like that from the youngest ages? It's an incredible way to design your own learning with, of course, support from a, a teacher who's going to make sure you're hitting all the areas. So we know what society looks like now with standard conventional education, right? We, we grow up maybe, you know, if we had the right parents that that tried their best. We all have parents that tried their very best, of course, but we, if we had the right stimulation and nurturance and support, we learn to, to be curious learners and creative learners and self-directed learners. But most of us, honestly, from first grade through high school, went to 
schools that are like prisons, honestly. <laughs> the bell rings, sit down, shut up, take notes, memorize, regurgitate. And there's only one right answer. We have all of that all the way through high school. And then as a result, we have um, the world that we have where there is so many people and I see in my clinical practice that are really intellectually smart, but don't feel a deep sense of confidence within themselves that they're on the right path in life. Mm. And that creates this existential stress that on some level is a root cause of so many stress-related illnesses that I see in my practice. Yeah. People don't really know that they don't even honestly feel they deserve to listen to their passions and listen to their heart and soul and, uh, and give themselves permission to explore that because that's been kind of like indoctrinated out of us. Yes. And we give all of our power away to sometimes um, not very good bosses instead of speaking up and saying this is not the optimal environment because we don't even know what the optimal environment feels and looks like because we haven't experienced it right so we all know the world that we have now please contrast that with a world where we have a whole generation of adults that has been raised in this way where we feel self-empowered and and confident that we're supported to explore our passions and our interests, that we have the right balance between the structure and the flexibility to do that. What would the world look like? Let's start with the workplace. What would the workplace look like if everybody was Montessori educated? I think this is, this is really why I do the work I do. I think that this is so critical for me because, you know, one of my favorite quotes ever is the Howard Thurman quote, you know, don't think about what the world needs, think about what makes you come alive, because the world needs people that have come alive. And children, if you look at children, or you think about yourself, when you were a child, a lot of us had a strong sense of what made us come alive, those things that you love to do as a child that you gravitated towards. It's, it's not the problem that people don't find what is their path and what makes them unique and what they're good at and what they love. The problem is they kind of, they, they had it and they lost it is often the case. You had it in childhood and, you know, for whatever reason, it wasn't appropriate to pursue it, whether it was a teacher or a parent or even just your own, you know, cultural beliefs or whatever that may be. And I, I think that educating children at its best looks like, very lovingly guiding them to follow their own path of development, to to discover those gifts and those talents, to create an environment where they even have the the opportunity to discover those gifts and talents because there's, you know, it's rich and there's freedom and there's enough structure to feel safe. So there's limits too. And then to nurture that and give them the space and give them the permission to follow that and to honor that. I think that the world would be so much more peaceful because I think people would be the best versions of themselves making their best contribution to society. So the the workplace, the world, it would look different and it would, you know, the, the output would be different because when people are all working on things that they're super into and, you know, is aligned with their personality and their strengths, the outputs are going to be much more amazing. We're going to be coming up with incredible solutions to all these problems that you mentioned up front when we started this episode. And I think that that's why Dr. Montessori was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize three times. I mean, this is really, you know, it's called an education for peace. It was developed at a time when Mussolini was in Italy. He actually kicked her out of Italy. She went to India. She spent a lot of time with Gandhi. She traveled the world, spent a lot of time with world leaders. But it really was designed to bring about a more peaceful society. And so there's a lot about in the classroom also about how we relate to one another, but it starts from the self. And I think with all those things that that you're talking about. So how do you run your office as a CEO? How do you bring Montessori thinking and the way that your organization culture is created differently from say other companies? Yeah, we, we try to make it as much of a Montessori environment as possible. And when we hire people, I mean, that's where we're looking for people who really are fired up about what we're doing. I, 
And if someone isn't, I'm doing them a favor by pointing that out to them, <laughs> honestly, like having that conversation, like, you know, you don't have to work here. Like, where would you, what really lights you up? And that's a conversation we're always having with, with people we're hiring, with people that work here and maybe are discovering it's not a good fit. That doesn't happen a lot. We have a lot of really happy people because we've created, you know, we try to create a flow environment and it's much easier with a startup. So people can work in the, in the way that suits them best. It's a much more flexible environment than, you know, a big corporation. So the, the, the question that comes to mind is like, oh, follow your passion. Do what gets you fired up. That sounds great. We all love the way that sounds. But isn't it true that we do still need the skill of doing boring things sometimes? Yes. <laughs> it you is. Know, just like there's a balance there, right? Like I, oh. I don't like doing paperwork, but by doing paperwork, it keeps my systems organized in my office so that I can do my passionate work more effectively, you know? So how does, um, how does Montessori also cultivate that? Well, children in a classroom are like, it's the teacher's job to make sure that, you know, if this child is just like, a linguist and all they want to do is spend time on language that they're also getting to the math and and we talk about the the teacher the guy to have like seducing the child into coming to the math area so trying to make it really exciting for them and I mean it, it is exciting because everything is hands-on and they're playing with beads and it's not like writing in a math workbook but you know there is kind of this idea of well even if you don't love it like this is something that that we gotta spend time on and so there's that balance and that's that's there in in school and in life and and I think teaching them you know we talked about children learning how to learn at the very youngest ages. And part of that is, is problem solving and, and critical thinking. And part of that is just persevering through kind of a little bit of the grunt work, because <laughs> that's going to happen no matter what. Well, I do know that a lot of people I know who hate math, for, for instance, I, I don't really know anybody who went to Montessori school that hates math. That's yeah. a really like that's something I've really noticed and maybe because just math was taught in such a horrible way in conventional <laughs> schools that people then associate math with something they hate. Yeah. Something that's yeah. tactile and colorful and fun, yeah. a game, you know? And yeah. so that programs your perception of like a whole area of human endeavor that you've decided sucks and is boring and you're not good at it. And that probably colors your, the whole rest of your life, what you permit yourself to even explore, you know? Totally. I, um, when I was teaching preschool, I had five-year-olds in my class doing long division and they don't even know they're doing it. They're just playing with beads. And then, you know, I contrast that with when I graduate, you know, I was taking like advanced, you know, statistics at Harvard, like really, I, I could do math, but when I took after that, my Montessori preschool teacher training, I was like, oh my God, I'm understanding things in a way I've never even thought of when it comes to math. Like we were, we were, we were talking about how we teach children how to cube and square numbers mm -hmm. and they play with cubes, like beads cubes and bead squares and it's not just about you know writing a number and putting a little three above it it's about actually understanding how that number is changed and manipulated in real life like holding it in your hands understanding math in that way is so powerful <laughs> i wish i went to montessori school so what about the social emotional development that kind of uh, it, it's really obvious anybody who starts exploring montessori that that is a such a powerful way for intellectual development and um, creativity and innovation and this ability to feel confident within yourself to follow your passion. But what about just social emotional development, developing collaboration and, and peacemaking skills amongst all the children? Where does Montessori sit with that? So in my work for Birth to Three, you know, it really starts with that relationship between a, a, a caregiver, an adult, a parent, and a baby, and, and making sure, you know, there's that secure, really loving attachment. Your child knows you love them and you trust them. That's like the basis, right? Affection literally impacts the development of the brain, and emotions are stored at the core of the brain. So, you know, the, your your ability to learn is intrinsically tied 
to, to those deep emotions. And children, you know, very young children are not yet ready to collaborate before creating that really strong sense of self. Even, you know, the three and four year olds in preschool are just starting to kind of work in groups and, and share. But having that really strong foundation of security and attachment and relationship with the teacher is the foundation of all of that. And then, and then later as they get a little bit older, there's a lot of group work, there's creative problem solving when, you know, when interpersonal issues arise, we have a peace corner in the classroom where children are encouraged to go and have a conversation about conflicts and work through it as you would, you know, with like, as we would if we had a conflict. Um, So kind of modeling that for them. And I love something my Montessori teacher told me, my trainer told me when we were learning how to become teachers, she said, when you're working with babies, you're teaching them what it means to be human. And that means you need to really work on your humanity and being the best human you can be because it's all modeling to a certain degree. You know, it's not what you say, it's who you are and they're going to see that. So working on ourselves and we call, you know, preparing ourselves as, as the parent, as the teacher is a huge aspect of Montessori teacher training. We were doing journaling and, you know, all sorts of confronting our biases and working through them. And because you, you want to make sure you're bringing, you know, a really good picture of humanity to the child. Wow. If you were like the queen of your own country, (laughs) how would you create different policies to support parents, to support teachers, so Um, that we can bring up this next generation with this kind of thinking, this kind of consciousness you're talking about? Give us a sampling of policies that you would put into place or support systems you would put into place. Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with like parental leave and parental support for people who are pregnant and having babies. I actually am Canadian. We all get a year off, but I don't live in Canada, so I don't I don't get that. I mean, I have a startup. <laughs> but I think just making it the norm that this is I think more about changing the culture than changing the policies, maybe because that's just, you know, naturally kind of what I gravitate towards, but the culture the cultural understanding that women when having a babies are, are like up leveling themselves. You know, we, there's all this research that shows after a woman has a baby, she's more creative. Yes. Um, and so honoring that and giving her the time and space to kind of in, step into that rather than, you know, bouncing back is like what we think about here, like getting back to what you were doing before and back to your old body. Like, no, 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 no. Let's go forward in an even more powerful way. And honestly, there's, there's just not enough time and space because of a pol- the policies here to do that a lot of the time. So a lot of leave, a lot of support. I would create, I mean, I would just make it so easy to, to create villages for ourselves where you can pick the people that you want to live in your village and you all do this together because this is not, I mean, this nuclear family with one or two adults taking care of one or two or three kids, like that's just not how it's supposed to be. (laughs) Yeah. What would you say to audience that is kind of planning ahead to have a family? What are some preparatory things we can do before we even become parents so that we can be the best of ourselves working with our kids? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. I think a lot of what we're talking about is good stuff to think about. There's so much just that we accept as cultural norms here that you know kids are gonna go to a normal school and and it's good to be like a doctor and an engineer. And these are like the kind of the things that we want for our kids for how they'll get, get ahead in life. And of course we want our kids to get ahead in life, but kind of questioning that there's a Montessori school principal, one of the best Montessori schools in the country. And he tells parents, if you send your child here, you need to be equally comfortable with the outcome that they want to be a lawyer or a rock musician (laughs) and getting, you know, getting, starting to question some of those old beliefs. And I think a lot of that is actually working on ourselves first, because if we are not confident in ourselves and we see our children as a reflection of us or an extension of us, 
and, and a failure, you know, where a personal failure if they've gone on to become a rock musician, that's a lot of problems um, <laughs> will stem from that. So working on ourselves, I think, is always the first step. Yeah, you know, in my clinical practice, a lot of times parents come in, well, women come in after they're pregnant to work on their health. But more and more now, there's a really changing tide. So if my patients come in six months to a year before even starting to try. Mm. Saying, We've decided we're going to be ready to start a family next year. So I'm coming in for a holistic health consultation to really plan a journey of preparation. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That so much that people are thinking like that now, you know, it's so beautiful. It makes me so heartened for the future that it used to be like, oh, I'm pregnant. So I should stop drinking alcohol and smoking cigarettes. But now people are planning ahead in that way. It's, uh, and in Chinese medicine and actually Chinese language terminology, the womb is called the literal medical term is child's palace. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, the gong is what is called child's palace. This idea that we want to create a palatial environment mm. to nurture and love our children. But when the, once they're born, how can we create a palatial environment in the home where they can learn and explore and be nurtured? That takes education and planning. Yeah. yeah. We, most of the Monty Kids customers come when they're pregnant, which also is so beautiful. I mean, I have just such deep admiration for these parents who are thinking like that. You know, we want to be ready for this. And, and that is actually the best time to start. So many families don't realize that you can set up a play and learning area for your newborn. You know, the, there's these horrible myths that babies, you know, babies just sleep and poop and that's all they do and they have no attention span and that is all garbage. We show parents how to set up a corner of their environment. We recommend to actually put it in the living room, not the baby's nursery, because the living room is really usually where you know, the family or the kitchen where the family really spends a lot of time. So you can lay your baby down in their little movement area while you're cooking dinner or while you're, you know, having tea with your partner. Um, and they can be doing their work and you can be doing yours and setting that up so they can like jump in right away and work on their mobiles. Our, my trainer used to say concentration is like a flower from birth. And if we water it and nurture it, it will bloom. And so being ready for them. So they're not just like staring at the ceiling, you know, in the first few months of life during those critical months of visual development is, is great. Yeah. It's such a gift to be around little ones because I, I had no idea before I became a parent that spending that amount of every single day quality time with a child, it just rewired all of my circuitry. And any hitches and glitches, maybe subconscious memories from my childhood sometimes get stirred up. I don't know if you've had experiences like that. And I'm like, oh, wow, there's a different way we could engage. Yeah. And it's like an instant reprogramming for the adults in the room with the kids that you see they're so malleable and so open. And then you're presented with like, it's almost like a quantum reality that you see like, wow, this is how I was engaged when I was at that stage of development, but there's a yeah. new option now. And then, yeah. and then you both heal in that process because you reprogram your relationship with that whole aspect of life. And so it's like so beautiful that this, this work that you're doing. Yeah, it is beautiful. There's a lot of reparenting that's just naturally happening for myself and, um, and then trickling down to my, my child. I have to say, I've had the honor of meeting your amazing siblings and your incredible parents. <laughs> Thank you. So you're the youngest of three kids. Yes. And all three of you guys are exceptional human beings. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I got to wonder, you know, your, your parents, what was unique about your upbringing? Because they've, they, I mean, it's not just a one hit wonder here. Yeah. They have a 100% hit rate of, of raising three brilliant children that are following their passions and doing insanely world changing work as entrepreneurs. Okay. How did they do that? Do you, do you, can you distill down the secret sauce? I don't, you know, I, I thought about that. My, my parents grew up really poor in Kenya. We were all born there and they, they really worked, you know, their butts off 
to, to kind of turn their lives around. Education was a really important thing on that journey. And so it became a very strong family value. You know, that's a, for a lot of immigrants, that's how you improve your situation. So education, I think they, they always just, my dad, I didn't know this at the time, but later he told me sometimes he didn't know where our tuition check was going to come from, but he just kept us in those schools because he just wanted us to have the best. So, I mean, education for sure. My mom just gave us a ton of love and a ton of, you know, support, which is kind of what I was talking about that connection being the foundation for it all. And my dad, you know, was able to really, uh, he's an incredible person and an incredible businessman and came from such, you know, unfortunate circumstances and then really built through entrepreneurship, built an incredible career for himself. And he always said something to us that was really beautiful, which was he wants us to stand on his shoulders. And I think that gave us a, a lot of, you know, just mentally kind of a lot of freedom that we don't have to go become doctors like a lot of families, you know, in our culture kind of t tell their kids, like, we really want you to become a doctor. It's not even, you know, it's not sugarcoated. It's not, it's not a secret. But like, stand, I want you to stand on my shoulders is such a gift because it freed us up to to go forward and figure out what contribution we can make in the world, given all that incredible background that, and support that they gave us. It's, it, I am so grateful for your dad, because you know, <laughs> and your mom, of course, they're the real trailblazers because they gave birth to the possibilities of the three of you guys doing this incredible work in the world. Yeah, you know, I'm very um, grateful also. I, I would love one day to interview, well, your dad is a little more chatty. I've met both your mom and dad. I'd love someday to interview your dad about that kind of like origin story, his philosophies. I've had the chance to chat with him a couple of times where he has very interesting, one of the things he said to me that really blew me away was he said, when you were going through your education, he, he says, most of the time people say, well, okay, let's say your kid is not good at math or not good at uh, English or, or, or reading and writing skills, whatever it is, people think you should go get a t tutor to work on the weakness. But he said for you, he saw that you were very talented in language. And so he really wanted you guys to nurture that gift. Mm -hmm. And that as a result of that, your language, your French skill skyrocketed and that kind of like slingshot all your other skills yeah, that yeah. sometimes working really wholeheartedly and what you're passionate at and what you're really good at makes you open whole new possibilities of, of the level in which you can excel in all things. Yeah, it's so true. You know, I, I, I just read a quote yesterday that said like, you know, understanding how amazing you really are is going to shift everything in your life. And I think that's kind of related because like once you, as a child, you know, I had a lot of things that I wasn't that good at. And then I had, you know, this, a lot of things I was good at. And then I had this really, like, it was a gift in French and in, and actually several other languages that I picked up later, but to develop that, just even the confidence alone that I'm excelling in this one thing, just helps you that extends to all the different areas you know and the growth mindset that I'm getting better and better at this thing and I actually started off my parents put me in a bilingual school at a young age and so I didn't know any French at seven years old and all these other classmates have been studying since kindergarten and so that that growth mindset that like I came in at the bottom and I've you know excelled to the the top of my class and those I mean I think people underestimate the ripple effects of really getting good at, at one thing. Wow. <laughs> There's so much I could talk with you about, but I know we're wrapping up the end of our hour here. So before we go on, how can we follow your work? How can we learn more about Montessori education in general? Some of us are, are parents, some of us are not, of course, but you've definitely piqued our curiosity about Montessori education and how that could ripple into society at large. How can yeah. we keep following your work? So uh, our website is montykids.com, M-O-N-T-I-K-I-D-S.com. That's, there's a lot of information there. We have a blog. We are on Instagram at Monty Kids, and I'm at Zara I. Kassam is my name uh, on Instagram if you want to follow me.
Mm. So Monty Kids is a subscription-based program that you've custom designed for children age zero to three mm -hmm. and well worth the investment for sure. I speak from personal experience. If there are listeners out there where it's not necessarily in their budget, I had heard you say things about is being made available in libraries also. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so we have a program where it's, we're piloting it in a few communities that have lending libraries in like a community center or an actual library where parents can come and check things out and get some guidance from, you know, the librarian and kind of work on it together as a group. So that's something we're piloting. We have customers all over the world in Monty Kids. We're expanding globally. And there's a lot of information on our blog and in our email, like newsletters and stuff. So there's a lot of things you can do, even if you don't want to just subscribe to, to MontyKids.com. There's a lot of stuff to learn. Awesome. Thank you so much for doing this beautiful work. I follow you on social media. So I, even though my boy has outgrown the age, there's still always so many beautiful posts that you that inspires parents of all ages, honestly. Yeah, social media. Instagram is a great place to get really inspirational tips. To wrap up this amazing conversation, you've had an incredible life, even though you're still a young lady. You know, being a mom of two growing boys, running a successful business, and all your journey coming from an immigrant family, rising through all kinds of challenges, watching the ups and downs of your parents' journey coming to this country, and then the way in which you and your brothers have excelled in their work. You know a lot about human potential, you know, from direct personal experience. So it's a really important question. If you could please distill it down to one most important piece of advice for our audience, what is the single most important thing we should know or learn about tapping into our highest level of human possibilities? I think this relates to my work, you know, and working with if you're a parent or anybody who has a child in their life, and then even to adults for, for ourselves. I think it is all about getting to know, to getting to know yourself. You know, what is your unique gift? What is your unique interest in the world? And allowing yourself the space to follow that. And it might start really small with a hobby, a side hobby. You know, the way that Monty Kids kind of, the origin origin was I wanted, I became a mom, I wanted to help parents. And so I started teaching mommy baby classes at the community center and I wasn't getting paid. And it was, you know, it was like the seedling of an interest that I allowed myself to follow, even though some people were like, why, why are you doing that? Like, seems like a waste of your time. Just like if we allowed ourselves to follow these, these little twists and turns that are guided by our curiosities, I think we would have a, an easier time figuring out where we can make our best contribution and then potential is just going to explode from there. So beautiful. I'm so grateful for your family nurturing you the way that they did and that you actually gave yourself permission to go out on a limb when, you know, I speak from experience too, that, you know, graduating from Harvard, you have all of your friends are getting high paying investment banking or management consulting or finance jobs, or maybe they're becoming lawyers and doctors and all those conventional paths. Society is really pushing us towards it. And it takes a, a whole different kind of courage to go out on a limb. And in your case, making no money for doing community work. And so I feel like just congratulations, you deserve all of this success. What a long journey to get to this point where you're really making the world a completely different place for the future of humanity. That is the <laughs> scope of your work that you're doing. And I'm so honored to call you my friend and so inspired by everything that you're doing. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Dr. E. It's definitely mutual. Thank you so, so much nice. for making time. Yeah, I'm so glad we did this. It was a lot Yay. of fun. Bye. Bye. Hey guys, great news. If you're a parent, grandparent, or have little ones in your life and you'd like to give Monty Kids a try, Zara has generously offered us a huge $45 discount on your first order of Monty Kids. 
When you go to MontyKids.com, use promo code CHAN45, that's C-H-A-N-4-5, to take advantage of this generous offer. We love Monty Kids at our house, and I hope you will too. Enjoy! Hi friends! Did you love that interview? If you did, please leave a review and share with all your friends so that many more people can benefit from these game-changing insights. You can also go onto our website, dredithubuntu.com, and subscribe to our newsletter, where you'll receive free trainings and next-level ninja tools that we only share on our newsletter. Together, let's turn your life into a brilliant masterpiece.